Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of the Commit Message Podcast presented to you by the University of Windsor's Computer Science Society. Today we're going to talk to Kyle, a student-facing member of the co-op program. He talks a lot about what the co-op program can provide, uh, a lot of the a lot of the nuances and a lot of frequently asked questions are asked and answered here. So it'd be especially imperative if you're a second year student who's going to be applying soon to be listening to what Kyle has to say. Other than that, I, I apologize for the very long delay. I think the longest one yet. Uh, I'll try and get some uh, episodes pre-uploaded. But other than that, uh, quick little intro. Enjoy the rest of the podcast. And we're back to the eighth episode, I think, of TCM. Today, we're with a very special guest, and we're not actually talking about their career progression, their specific uh, <coughs> opinions, but we are talking about where they're from. Kyle here is from the co-op office at the University of Windsor. Now, I know a lot of people have a lot of mixed opinions about the co-op office, but we're here to say the truths, the myths, the you know, the falsehoods. What can you expect from the co-op program at the University of Windsor, specifically the computer science program, right, Kyle? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how long have you been at the co-op office? About a year and four months now, I believe. And you work towards, like, the more students-facing side, right, Kyle? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay. So... (sighs) beyond why University of Windsor doesn't have as many sources and things like that, that that won't be in the scope of this podcast. Uh, Just wanted to say up front. Okay, so we're going to talk more about the student-facing side, and uh, we'll go from there, right? So let's let's start very basic, I guess. Uh, What is the co-op program? And I'm, I'm, I'm sure this is, this is like, uh, what's it called? A very basic question. But could you explain it in a way such that you could show, like, what it means to be in the co-op program versus what it's not in, what it means to not be in the co-op program? Absolutely. So the biggest difference between being a co-op student and non-co-op student is the actual work experience you'll gain. Mm Mm-hmm. So through the University of Windsor, the co-op office has been there for a very long time, so we developed a lot of different relationships with different employers, both locally and within the greater Ontario area as well. Mm -hmm. So what's nice is once you graduate with your degree, by default, we do allow up to four work terms, and possibly more if you want, and terms to get experience. But by the end, you're guaranteed, if done successfully, to have three work terms under your belt, which is the equivalent of one full year of experience which will help you gain that competitive edge over other students. And you'll be able to really learn skills that you can't really grasp within the classroom, which is great. Right. And to add on to that, I mean, I know a lot of students, and I know it's primary, but maybe not not <clears throat> secondary, tertiary, but a lot of people come in for the, for the jobs. And I would say co-op definitely guarantees you some work terms. Now, it's on you whether you land them or not, of course, as we'll go into a bit later. But there's a very high likelihood that you'll get something within your field if you join the co-op program. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. And you have a full team supporting you as well. So you're never alone throughout the whole process. Right. Okay. So. All right. So I'm in university starting first year now by the time this releases. Uh, I didn't sign up for the co-op program. Is there a way I can get in? Yes. Great question. So the latest you can actually get into the co-op program would be within the first, within early September for your second year. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's that's and, enough time for the transform course, I'm guessing? Sort of. So what happens is by the latest you sign up by beginning of September, you'll start the transform course, which we'll talk about later on as well, yeah. starting in October that same semester. Yeah, and so that way everything gets lined up. And that way we have enough courses available to ensure you get all your work terms in as well by starting that. Okay. So is there any kind of requirement? Do I need to complete X amount of courses? Do I need a minimum percent average? What is it like getting into co-op post uh, university beginning? Absolutely. So assuming 
you are entering as a second year student trying to get into the co-op program. Usually by then, you would typically have eight to 10 courses completed by going through your first year. And in terms of admission averages, we look for a major average of 65% and above, and a minimum accumulative average of 60% or above, with no, mark, with no more than one mark below 50% on your transcript. You sound like you've been saying that a lot, the way you've memorized those numbers. <laughs> oh yeah, it's, it's admission season, so we're starting to get to see them a lot. <laughs> okay, so uh, before we move on, is there a difference between international and domestic students when it comes to getting into co-op? Great question. The one, in terms of qualifications, academics are still the same. So okay. a major average is 65% and a minimum of 60 for a cumulative average. But other than that, when we judge applications, we look at them more of a holistic perspective. So what's your work experience like? If you have any, your volunteer experience, extracurriculars, and your willingness to relocate if you want to as well, such so okay. as if you find a job in the GTA area. Right. So the only real difference when it starts to come between domestic and international students starts to come when it comes to fees once you're in the program. Mm -hmm. So for domestic students, it's $455 per semester up to eight semesters. And then for international students, it's 565 a semester. Once again, up to eight semesters. All right. Nice. So uh, I want to hit on this point before we go into the weeds, if you will. A lot of CS programs at certain schools live and die by their co-op program, correct? Uh, I'm, uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, part of the conversation that I want to add on to. Waterloo, for example, number one CS school in the country, most would say, has Waterloo Works, their, for, their form of the co-op program, right? What differentiates University of Windsor's co-op program between something like Waterloo or something like even Western... Oh, what is the advantages and disadvantages, would you say? Yeah, absolutely. So, of course, I'm not entirely familiar with all of Waterloo's yeah. procedures and how they operate. But two of the biggest ones would be, one being some of our unique relations we have with employers. Right. Especially locally. One of them especially being Rocket Innovation Studios. Yeah. They've been hiring co-op students for the past few semesters, and even some of the larger banks. We have great relationships, too. And it's really amazing to see how much student support comes from their own co-op and internship programs internally from those companies. Mm -hmm. Especially trying to get more involved with Windsor because we do have a lot of great talent. And right. it's always amazing. Every semester I always work at least 200 semester, 200 resumes at least. And to be honest, there's always that little bit of imposter syndrome when I start reading everyone's resumes. Because some of the stuff I read is really awesome and it's great. And I'm like, yeah, of course they would hire you after reading all this. So that's where our job comes in to make sure we help you mark yourself better to make sure those skills really do get shown throughout a resume and throughout your other career readiness skills too. Right. There's another and, pull of co-op, yeah. right? They take you from zero to job, right? There, There is that information, right? Exactly. Absolutely. And we don't expect you to have... You can come in with zero experience. That's perfectly fine. Uh, especially when you are a first year or a second year student. We... Of course, we don't expect you to have like four months of like software engineering experience under your belt already. So even if you only have projects or volunteer experience, that's perfectly fine because we'll teach you how to market those in order to cater different job postings. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And especially with Windsor, there is a very unique thing with the University of Windsor. And although it's not directly tied to the co-op office, its proximity to the United States, particularly Detroit, is very interesting because... Certain companies will have U.S. offices, or you can directly apply to Detroit offices coming out of university. And if you have the co-op experience to back it up, a lot of people do do what what we all know, or like all your friends know, who go to who are in Windsor, right? They live in Windsor, go cross the border, work in Detroit, come home, and even now with like the boom of remote, like it's become like a <clears throat> a huge huge like trend, I guess especially in the Windsor area. So that's that's a reason I would also add on, even though it's not directly tied to co-op, it, it is regional in that way, right? So, mm. okay. Absolutely. So uh, I know I noticed you said uh, Windsor has great connections with regional and provincial. Uh, w what can we expect from co-op program in terms of international, like, help? Great question. So... You touched a little bit on it already, where we do have some employers 
usually from a guided job search when a student yeah. finds a position on their own, where we review on a case-by-case -case basis on whether we can actually let them go into the United States to work. But one of our international players is actually in Germany as well. Right mm -hmm. now, they take a lot of engineering students, but I can't confirm anything yet since oh. I don't know myself yet. But there is a possibility of computer science positions opening up there too wow. with that same employer. And I know this has been in the works for a while as well, but there's also a position trying to be worked in where it relates to the I go global mm -hmm. aspect. I think I got that right. But that's specifically designed to look in more international placements because we do realize that a lot of our student base does have a lot of international students as well. So we want to open as many opportunities as possible and not close doors for that. Right. Okay. So uh, before we go into exactly uh, your process as a student, let's talk a little bit more about your role so that we're crystal clear, right? What does your day-to-day -day hmm. look like? That is a very good question. A lot of my day-to-day -day stuff, I would say it's about 70% emails, helping students decipher between their work-study sequences, answer questions on work terms, and then the other 30% would be more on handling administrative matters and making sure that students are set up for success earlier on. Mm -hmm. So planning workshops, making sure we have relevant material. So yep. computer science students really get a good advantage going to the job competition. And then marking different materials as well, such as resumes, cover letters, practicing interview skills, and even doing work term assessments where we speak one-on-one -on -one with students on their work term yep. to see how they're going and if there's anything we could do to help on our end. Okay. All right. So that's all the preliminary information I needed to hear, at least. So let's dive <laughs> straight into it. All right. So students will notice that when they're in the co-op program, the first year is actually completely identical to a normal non-co-op term, right? So <laughs> you'll have your first two semesters, radio silence, and then they'll come in at your third or let's say fall tw fall of the next year, mm -hmm. depends how, how you sequence it, and they'll say, all right, you have to do this thing called a transform course. And this course, as far as I can tell, is supposed to get you job ready. Now, is this accurate? What, what are you trying to convey with this transform course? Yes, absolutely. So our transform course is developed to give you the competitive edge needed to make sure your career readiness skills are set. Okay. So this where we will go through the fundamentals, such as learning how to write a proper resume, learning how to write a cover letter, and then practicing your interview skills as well. Mm -hmm. Especially uh, in the case for domestic students as well, when you come out from high school, they teach you a lot of different career readiness skills, which yep. isn't exactly appropriate for a university student. Yep. So teach you how to properly format your resume, such as taking out high school because it's no longer relevant. Yep. It's something you don't really know before you actually get into it. Along with teaching you the fundamentals of how to actually apply to jobs as well. So learning how to dissect a job posting and learning how to upload documents into our internal system so you're ready the following semester. Right. Okay. Uh, okay, so here's where a bit of confusion starts to happen with Transform. And I know this is the case with a lot of, I wouldn't say how would you describe it? Like high performing students in terms of jobs? I mean, it's kind of strange to say. Students who get jobs on their own who are typically seen as like higher end internships or co-ops. Is is that like correct ph phraseology? I, I don't know how to say it, but those students who, who go through the transform course will typically make a resume for the transform course and then use their ex actual resume elsewhere. Is Is there like some sort of like, I don't know, a little bit of deficiency maybe when it comes to at least cs sided resume making when it comes to transform good question a lot of the times i see especially when it comes to our master of applied computing students they'll use the same resume they used from transform okay uh specifically for undergrad cs i can't give an exact number for that because i can't pinpoint it but Throughout the semester, I do see a lot of students who come to me asking for that extra advice. And mm -hmm. we go through their resume. And a lot of the times, I do see their transform resume being used, okay. which is great. That being said, if you have a different resume outside of transform, because you find that the job posting doesn't really match what you wrote for transform, 
that's perfectly fine as well. Mm-hmm. As long as we're able to teach you the fundamentals of being able to cater a job posting to the skills required, or even teach you some of the fundamentals that shouldn't be on a resume as well, such yep, as using the word right. I, he, and she, and all of that, that's the greatest thing we want to bring across for it, too. Right. Okay. And how about, <clears throat> let's say, in mock interviews? Because a few, like, of course, it's hard to get an entire co op office to be learn to train data structures and algorithm or like hard hard skills kind of interviews but how far does the mock interview kind of go because Good behavioral question. i'm sure you can do but i'm not sure how hard you can drill technical issues yeah absolutely you know what that's a really good point you brought up actually so when it comes to transform specifically aka the course where we teach you all these skills we are looking to include some kind of easier technical question in there not so much a code xyz but maybe something such as what's the difference between a stack and a queue okay. something easy but because we realize that transform has a very wide scope and covers all our different faculties in our program mm-hmm. we actually created additional programming in the semester after where it becomes more useful when you're actually about to do an interview so for myself i helped create these resources so we actually do technical interview workshops where we go through everything you just mentioned as well Mm -hmm. So I think there's about 30 to 40 questions we'll go through on Kahoot together. We'll go through different data structure problems, seeing how different functions can be used as well in different ways, Mm -hmm. along with even going some basic terminology. Like what's the difference between polymorphism and inheritance? Yep. In addition, the brand new to this semester actually, is we do have mock technical interviews now as well for students of the job competition, where we haven't had anyone sign up yet because everyone's very busy with exams. But it's nice because it's exclusive just for undergrad CS. Right. Because we do realize that support is needed, and we do hear that it is what students want. And we're very excited to actually show it. So once someone actually books an appointment, I'm very excited to actually do it. So I have two full questions ready to go. Okay. Okay. Sounds interesting, actually. Very mm-hmm. promising. Because I know that 99% of students definitely did not know that, including me. <laughs> so. Yes. Yeah, Where so can... right now we just advertise it to our competing students uh, okay. to make sure that they're the ones who get priority right now. Okay. But yes, they're definitely available in the coming right. semesters too. So, Not bad. Okay, so, mm-hmm. all right. Uh, more on to the uh, Transform course, right? So uh, would why is it that the Transform course is a requirement? Is it because that maybe like you can't let someone go through without actually assuming their baseline is at a certain amount? That's a good question. In terms of a base amount, yes, we do expect resumes and cover letters to be at a professional level. Yeah. And what's really good for Transform is we've been using a software where we have AI actually looks at your resume and make recommendations for you. Okay. And then an actual human, aka myself or another one of my colleagues, will go through it even further with you. Because every semester I do see the same mistakes being made a lot, especially yeah. for grammar, formatting. And there's some things a computer can't catch that a human can write. So it's mm-hmm. because of targeting. Even when I see students for one-on-one appointments, the differences I help them make to help explain some of their ideas more is outstanding. Right. I know a lot of times a student will probably put like a hackathon or a project on there. But when an employer reads it, it doesn't add any value to that because they're not expressing those skills. So by teaching them to include numbers, being very specific, or even applying that Google XYZ formula, we're showing what you achieved, measured by Y, and then bring it back to Z. Okay. So you're really creating those meaningful bullet points. So an employer actually sees it as valuable. Okay. And in the typical co-op sequence, your second year summer is going to be your first work term. But as far as I know, while you're doing Transform, or even before then, co-op does not actually recommend, or is this kind of old information, does not recommend applying to positions while you're doing Transform. That is correct. Okay. And we do know it is an issue, and there are policies in place because it's a smaller part of a larger puzzle that goes into it. But we do hear issues. Uh, For example, I know Amazon opened their summer internship positions. 
Yeah, but okay. if you were in the fall semester, you can't apply yet in terms of co-op's rules, which I completely understand yep. um, the frustrations associated with it. And it's funny you mentioned that because I actually did have a conversation yesterday <laughs> with some of our employee writing coordinators to see, well, is there something we could do about this? Because we do see that students are trying to see, and we don't want to limit your, you guys as all well as well. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing stopping you from, you know, not saying anything to the co-op program, applying, and then when it comes to the term, say you did a guided job search, nothing really stopping you from doing that, right? Well, we do check things beforehand okay. as well. Usually the employer will reach out to us saying like, oh, can you confirm that they're a co-op student? Or most of the time, a student could ask, they need an enrollment letter asking for okay. co-op. So if you're not applying to jobs during a certain job competition or assigned term, then we wouldn't be able to provide that confirmation either for the employer. And yeah. thus, it could put you backwards. And that has, well. and that nightmare scenario has happened before. Uh, so there you have it. Don't try and sneak around co-op too much. Uh, no, I would say it, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So that being said, too, um, we do we do understand the frustrations when there's a really good opportunity, but you can't apply yet because it's your semester. We understand, but there's so many jobs offered through co-op as well. When when it is time for your assigned job competition semester, there's possibilities that you don't even know existed. Because okay. I know a lot of people like to go for fan companies, right? And they do their hiring practices a little differently. Yep. But in the terms of co-op, we're really trying to help you get those fundamental skills through those early placements early in your career to set you up for fame post-graduation as well. Right. Okay. So uh, uh, you quickly breezed over something, but I forgot to make it crystal clear. When an employee checks if you're a co-op student, that means they're actually looking for a sort of benefit, right? Because you're actually incentivized as an employer to take a co-op student, right? If yes, I... depending on the employer. Yeah. I know... I. Don't paraphrase me on this one, but I do believe tax incentives are a benefit from hiring co-op students, mm -hmm. at least in Ontario, I think. But most of the time, too, is in their job postings, they'll specifically say they have to be returning to full-time studies next semester. Yep. And usually with being a co-op program, our sequence is already lined up that way, so we can basically confirm that, yes, they will be returned full-time. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And... Uh... Yeah, that confirms most of the 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 suspicions we had around uh, transform. Uh, is after you're done the one transform, you're just gonna assume we're done for life, right? Uh, you're ne you're never ever gonna have a second transform, so that's about that's about mm -hmm. as far as your education goes in terms of uh, co-op, right? Yes and no. So you won't have any more courses like transform to take. But you will have those additional resources such as one-on-one -on -one technical mock interviews and technical work mm -hmm. workshops and even employer-specific workshops where even they teach them their own interviewing practices as well. Yep. So I always like to say, earlier I said my day is like 70% answering emails. It really is because I do talk with a lot of students. Yep. And it's really good, especially if it's through an MS Teams call and I get to see the smile on their face where like it finally clicks once I get the answer they need. And even... If it's an opportunity we can't do through co-op, I always try to offer some alternative as well. Like maybe right. asking the employer if they can hire you on a non-co-op basis as well. Or so, even referring them to a different service on campus. So I never want to have a student leave feeling defeated. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, you're trying to get a job at the end of the day, right? Yep. So I always try to find an alternative to help you. Okay. And how does the, let's say, CS side of co-op Comp, uh, contrast to like an another engineering side right because you got different postings for them but mm -hmm. are they actually held by different staff good question so when it comes to different postings like that there's a lot of overlap so okay. our employee writers coordinators specifically for undergrad CS they would be Bill and Jeff currently and they help maintain most of the CS job postings that come in. Mm -hmm. But they'll also operate under certain verticals as well. So maybe some are just focused on tech, some are focused on banking, and right. others would be focused on, let's say, government and nonprofit. Yep. So all the ERs have a little 
taste of it too. But I guess a better answer to be would be as a whole, they all work to create job development opportunities. Because even if they're hiring for a business position, well, maybe they could tap in for engineering or computer science positions at the same yeah. time as well. <laughs> okay, so, all right, we've gone through the transform. <laughs> so we're on to the fourth semester, typically, your first ever job competition. What do you recommend? What do you not recommend? What are common misconceptions? Give me it all. Great question. All right, so I always like to say, First and foremost, don't try to compare yourself to others because it can be very easy to fall in the trap thinking that you're not good enough if you see everyone else getting a job early on. Yeah. And then here you are, oh no, summer's almost coming. I'm panicking, what do I do? Job opportunities will always be available throughout the semester. And I even like to say too, if you're still competing later on, that actually works in your favor because now there's less competition to deal with as well. Yep. When it comes to creating resumes as well, I always like to say create targeted resumes as much as you can and apply to as many different opportunities that you're genuinely interested in as well. Because the last thing you want would be apply to something just for the sake of getting a job and you end up hating it. Yep. Mm -hmm. And in terms of timing, I always say try to apply as much as you can earlier on because as the semester goes, especially after rainy week, you're going to be busy with midterms, exams, and different assignments. Yep. So try not to stress yourself out too much by having co-op on top of it all too. Yeah. And if you really are struggling, that's okay. That's where our office is, specifically me, where I'm here to help as well. Yeah. Like I said, the amount of students I see in a week is, I almost said insane, but that's not the right term to use. But it's always nice to see students coming in. Okay. Know that they have that support there. Are you guys in, in the office really... or are you still like in from home? Oh, what's the... Yep, so we're in office. Uh, some of us have work from home days, yep. but our office is always available, and we have drop-in hours from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Okay, okay. <laughs> all right, so uh, all right. So I'm a student applying in winter. Nothing's going right for me. What do I do? Uh, we're at, let's say, because they have three phases, right? So <laughs> let's say I made it through the two first two phases, zero interviews, but I have applied to a lot of places. What would you say to that student? Good question. So in that case, if you're not getting any interviews, that's a resume problem. Okay. Because no one's even giving you the chance based on your resume. Okay. So the biggest thing that always comes from it is an employer generally spends about seven seconds reading a resume. Yep. So what I do with the student, I literally go with them one by one. We'll first create a profile of skills at the very top. Yep. Because if they're only spending seven seconds reading a resume, then likely what they grade at the top is going to be very important. So if we could create three to four bullet points that are directly related to the job and shows that you would accomplish something with it too, that's a big bonus. Okay. And then helping them format their experience as well. I know a very common thing I see is someone will have really good experience, but they'll put it on the bottom. And the reason they do that is because time-wise, the most present thing usually comes up first, right? Mm -hmm. So little hacks that would help too is, oh, we'll just create two different headings then such as like related work experience and additional work experience. Yeah, it's a cool mm -hmm. way of thinking about it. Okay, mm -hmm. right. So uh, after the first two phases, uh, it's pretty actually funny how how it's like, how uh, it's phrased, but like, I, I remember reading the email once, like it kind of feels like co-op's like, all right, I can't trust you guys for shit. So in phase three, <laughs> we're just gonna apply for you guys. Uh, what happens there? Because I've always wondered, like, where are they applying that we haven't already applied? You know? Good question. So, first to clarify, we don't think of you that yeah. way. Right? <laughs> I know. So, honestly, <laughs> the biggest reason we do that is because we realize once it's April, you're in exam mode, right? Yeah. So you don't have time to apply to jobs. So that's where we take some of the burden off so you can focus on your exams. Yep. <laughs> and... Like I said, I know it can feel really easy to think it's like, I didn't get anything around one or two. Obviously, maybe I'm not made for computer science. Maybe I should just drop out. No. Mm -hmm. Even throughout the past month in August, I've been seeing so many students get placed left and right. Um, some opportunities at the university. Sometimes yeah. it's just employers that are just really late to it. And they haven't done anything yet. And they're like, oh, no, like, can we still hire someone? And 
I know there's some specific names, I don't want to say them out loud, but some specific <laughs> undergrad CS students I've seen, and I've seen them maybe struggle in February, and now they finally found something. Okay. Or sorry, not February, in June, and now in August, they found something. Wow. Which is great. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, which is always a good feeling, because I think a good mantra through our office is, we can always go to sleep well every night if everyone gets placed. So even knowing that there's a few students that haven't been placed yet, it's amazing to see how the OERs really find different opportunities out there. And then even on my side, where it's more student-facing side, you wouldn't have seen this, but we start to started to send almost insider emails, which gives tips on what you can do for your resume, such as adding burn stack projects, because yep. those would be really beneficial. Right. And then even offering different jobs you haven't even considered yet, or even different sites you haven't even explored yet. Yep. So really giving that push to make sure students don't feel defeated, because we understand it could be very easy to fall under there, but really giving them as many resources as we can. Man, I wish I had you during my first uh, co-op term. There was no one front-facing like you right now, or <laughs> back then, I guess. So anyways, uh, continuing on, and mm. stuff will only get better from here, right? Because, of course, you're making oh, these improvements absolutely. with with intentions to get better than before, right? So, okay. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. what do you do? And you touched about uh, touched on this, and it, it might be a little bit difficult to talk about. What do you do with students that don't get placed? Because there's a few ways you can go about this. There's, A, the student's perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I attempt... Well, it's usually not true, but they'll, they'll think in their head, A, I, I did everything co-op asked of me, or at least what they think they did. And then I applied, and they're still taking fees, but I don't have a job. And then there's a co-op angle, which is, well, we tried our hardest, our, our things were open, this person was either A, very unlucky, or B, uh, just didn't do X, Y, and Z. We're still going to take the money for the services we charge. What is, the, what is the thought process going on there? How do you deal with that? That's good well firstly i like to say i wish we didn't have to charge any fees at all <laughs> to begin with because we understand it, it is an expense right yep so and usually what happens a lot and it's really a simple solution actually is if they don't get placed one semester i'll literally sit with the student we'll go one by one Re especially recently i've been helping them just switch their work studies sequence around so, oh. oh, if they didn't get placed this semester, no worries, we'll have you compete again next semester. And I'll help them set up their courses as well. So that way, that's a less worry for them as well. Yeah. And it can be really beneficial, too, going into a new competition knowing you didn't get anything last semester. Because now, you get there's always a little bit of luck involved a bit. Mm -hmm. Now there's reoccurring job posting seen the first time around. They're like, oh, I know this resume didn't work the first time. Let me try with this one now. So yep. you can update resumes from there. And there's always new opportunities coming in too. Especially when students do co complete a guided job search. So that's when they find opportunities on their own. If they build a good reputation, they'll continue to hire university students in the future as well, right? Mm -hmm. So there's opportunities that didn't exist in the previous semester that might be more suitable for your skills now. And I always like to say too, once you're another semester in, that's another semester worth of skills you have to your resume now. Another yep. group project you could show. Maybe it's another hackathon you went to. Or maybe it's even some like extracurriculars or volunteer experience you did uh -huh. as well, which is great. And worst case scenario as well, I always like to say, even let's say very worst case scenario, five semesters have passed, they haven't found anything yet, right? Wow. I always like to say, even if you don't have any experience when you graduate after co-op, you will find opportunities out there. You yeah, will find opportunities. The reality of CS is that there are more jobs than there are people in the end. So uh, mm. we're currently in a good spot to say that, right? So mm. okay. Absolutely. And just on an anecdote, I know one of my very best friends, actually, she graduated from computer science just as of April. Okay. Um, Congratulations. I know she was a little worried. Yeah, absolutely. Shout out to her. She was a little worried because she didn't do co-op or had work experience. But I remember working on her resume, like one-on-one, -on -one, we spent like a good two hours really customizing it 
to really okay. showcase her skills. And I was blown away. She got like five interviews within the matter of like two weeks. Wow. And I had to choose between like two offers. That's as well. crazy. <laughs> exactly. And it yep. kind of ties to what you said, right? It's like there's always more jobs than people, yeah. especially in computer science. Yep. So even if you don't find anything now, it's such a short term problem. Five years from now, that's not even going to be a worry anymore. You okay. know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. And <clears throat> I wanted to ask you this because you're probably the one of the few people in the university that knows. And it's probably one of the like failings, I guess, of this podcast is because we over index on software engineering or software development. What is the split between students that go towards IT, software development, data science, hardware? Because co op is supposed to encompass all of this, right? And there's even mm-hmm. AI, which is another subfield. Oh, what what do you say is like the split between students who go towards those areas? Wow, that's a really good question, actually. So, when I'm just thinking of job opportunity, so just to clarify, do you mean stu- like the type of jobs the students end up getting through co-op in those areas, or I meant they're enrolled in? Uh, the ones that end up getting the offer so like the of the ones you talk about uh, or it could even mean let's say there's there's two ways you can go about this where they want to go and where they end up going right let's say okay Mm -hmm. let's go where they want to go from all the ones you've talked to let's not try and encompass everyone from Mm -hmm. all the ones you've talked to whose ambitions lie towards software development like 60 percent 40 percent what would, what would you say? I would say, ambition-wise, about 90% of students that I've spoken to want to find like a software engineer role. Okay. That's their number one they want to go for when going to co-op. Okay. Uh, do people want to like straight up software development or like something like AI, something like game dev? Like, oh, oh what, what would you say most people are t- going towards? Good question. Based on our job postings, it tends to go more towards general software development. Not many game dev roles. Yep. At least I can remember from the Tommy Hatter offered. Yep. And when I do have conversations with students, I think throughout the past two years, I think I've had two or three students specifically mention game dev okay. with it. Uh, of course, I can't remember if they actually got game dev roles in the end. Yep. But a lot of the time, students say they just want to go into software engineering. And a lot of the times, I'll literally hear, like, I don't care what I'm doing there, as long as I'm doing some kind of coding. Yep. And yeah. Which is fair, right? Especially for your first experience, it's almost like you can't afford to be that picky. Okay, right? and, all right, which is which leads us into the next big issue I see a lot of people running into. A lot of these, uh, these students, they want to get into software development, me included, and this pertains to me, and so a lot of my friends, too. They try and get mm-hmm. into software development, However, they get handed with the IT role, or they get handed with some role they didn't want and they perceive as lower, or I guess that's as straight up as I can be, right? Uh, This happens all the time, and what would you say to that kind of student? Yeah, I would absolutely say that, especially this happens a lot when it comes to your first work placement, right? Absolutely. And I always like to say, not to use it as a stepping stone, But just know now when you're going to future job competitions, you have this IT experience and a more professional reference to back you up as well. Also, your company definitely has software developers. Exactly. 100%. And now you're developing that network of references that you didn't have beforehand, right? Yep. So even if you do go for an IT role at, I don't know, let's say, I think the CRA does IT roles. Yep. Well, now you just access a network within the government yep. of all places, too, where yep. you can now possibly have software development roles. Yep. And even even think about positions post-graduation as well, right? Yep. It's maybe they don't offer specific software development roles for co-op, but since someone knows you well there and they've seen your work ethic, well, now when you go for post-graduate opportunities, you don't have to worry about applying to like 100 different jobs. You can just maybe just go to one person because now you establish a network with okay. it. Mm-hmm. All right, so... And, oh, yeah. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, one last thing. I always find this a little funny when I hear, talk to students as well, is yes, they were expecting to go into software engineering, 
Yes. But a lot of the time, especially when they go into like a database or let's say an IT yeah. role, they end up loving it a lot. Yeah. Because especially when I find, especially for IT roles, it's usually like really great for cultures. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, and oh yeah. They say that coming to work is almost fun because of it. Yep. Uh, specifically, I know when I meet with students, especially from the University of Windsor's IT department, they do a great job with it. They always like to have fun on the job. And I can even tell, too, even when I'm, like, walking by, I'll see, like, two students walking down Wyandotte with lunch together. And I'm like, oh, I know you guys. You guys are from IT. And you could tell, like, they're smiling. They're enjoying the work they're doing. Of course, you're having to deal with problems to solve, right? Yep. But it's always exposing yourself to those different industries as well. Because you may have been 100% going into software development, but you may end up loving IT in the end because it mm. might be working better for you. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you know what? Like, whether you want to go on beyond whatever you've landed, if you think it's a lesser role, it probably isn't. There's someone who has it worse. There's always someone who's a bit unluckier. Uh, th there's definitely worse places to be than in a, a lower job, if, you, if you'll if you say, say it like that. But yeah. yeah uh, there's people who wish they could be in your role. Yes. As well, right? Yeah, that's... So, yeah. Of course, we're not lower in IT, of course, there's so many great opportunities with the field of IT as well. I know some students that I spoke with as well, while I was still a CS student, they ended up loving IT a lot more than software engineering as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it really depends on what kind of work you want to do, right, for it. And that's a great benefit of co-op, being able yep. to experiment within all these different fields, see what you like and what you don't like. Uh-huh. Okay. And uh, all right, so... My next question has to do with uh, slightly controversial before, but now co-op kind of covers it called the guided job search, and we've skimmed mm -hmm. over this in the past. It's no secret that if you want, if you want the big and the glamour, you have to do it by yourself, right? How does co-op uh, help you in this endeavor? Good question. So, I guess I'll redefine a few bits of the okay. question too. that's fair but generally when it comes to a guided job search there's two main areas we look at okay one is if you're applying to a role within windsor essex or child and kent okay. we always say come to us first because it's likely we have a relationship with that employer already and the reason why they may not be hiring off the spot or on my success yet is because they're waiting for the next job posting to come back before you can apply for it. Okay. And the second one being is if you do find positions within outside of that region, so such as Waterloo, Toronto, or the other GTA area, yep. you don't necessarily need our permission to apply to them right away for that. You could just go through the resume process, interview process, and then let us know if you get an offer. Yeah. But that being said, if you do have an interview with them coming up, I'd be more than happy to help with a mock interview, right? Yep. Or even if there's a really good opportunity and you need your resume checked out, we're here to help too, right? Because even if you're not using one of our job opportunities on my success, that's perfectly fine. If you find something you're really interested in, we don't want to hold you back on that. Okay, and this is a recent development, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, because I remember, uh, I'm not sure how long ago it was when Eric was telling us, uh, that must have been at least four years ago, Co-op actually didn't like you going out on your on by yourself, right? So this is like more of a recent development, as far as I know? To be honest, I can't say anything on that, because okay. I don't know of it. But yeah, no, at least for the past two years I've been here, we've always been open to like other opportunities. Okay. There is just some criteria we look at. Yeah. Uh, the big four actually being related to your, your field of study, yep. too make sure you're being paid because we want to make sure you're working. <laughs> so you want to make sure you're getting income from that. Three, working a minimum of 35 hours a week. And okay. four, being at least 12 weeks of life. Okay. And I can say circumstantially, I did a guided job search. It was very quick and painless from co-op. Uh, it was like two emails and they let me in. So uh, that's... <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, my I think that's how it goes usually too. So Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so your first co-op term is over. Now, what everyone hates to hear, hates to see, wants to know why it exists. I'm going to have to do this soon, like in like a couple weeks. Wait, like a week or two. Uh, it's, 
two or three weeks. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> You wrote the S- the email yourself, didn't you? For, uh, for... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the co-op essay, the dreaded essay that only ever expands by 500 words each term, right? I think so. Yeah, it gets a little longer each term. <laughs> <laughs> so break it down to me. Why is it there? Uh, what's its purpose? Everything about it. Go ahead. Absolutely. So a key piece of experiential learning is actually that reflective piece. So through the junior, intermediate, and senior work term reports, they're each meant to target different modes of reflection. So when it comes to your first work term report, that's the one you're going to be writing, correct? Because um, it's your first work term? Second, second. work term. Second? Yeah. Okay. So you're familiar with this one already. Yeah. So this is more of a reflective piece, really seeing what you liked, what you didn't like, and what skills you need to improve on going to the next competition as well. Yeah. When it comes to the intermediate, this is more of a market analysis. Okay. So now you're almost halfway through through your degree, a little more at that point, and you have to start thinking, it's like, oh, I probably have like a year or year and a half left. Yep. I should probably start to see what different areas within Canada, Ontario, or even internationally will be best for you. And what companies would be great too. Because that way you can start thinking of different skills and different techniques to apply to them. Yep. And lastly, when it comes to the senior technical report, this is almost like an accumulative project where you're really taking everything you learned from your work term and throughout your four years of study to really demonstrate what you've learned in the classroom and in the workplace as well. And okay. I know specifically, nothing's confirmed yet, but I think we are trying to change the intermediate report as well, which won't happen within two weeks. <laughs> but we do realize that that one specific report gets a lot of feedback that needs to be changed. So work will most likely, don't paraphrase it too much there, uh, be done to it. So it better reflects the needs of what students want, right? Because maybe they're not focused on a market analysis anymore. Maybe it's, I don't even know what it is yet, but maybe there's a specific skill you want to hone in on. Like maybe okay. you want to learn MongoDB and you want to physically learn more about it. Yep. So maybe that's where your report revolves around. So now it's catered towards improving your own weaknesses. Okay. Uh, and let's uh, let's try and zoom out a bit. I know there's a couple students in the previous episode, which won't air for present time of recording. It won't air for a while, but mm-hmm. it was Jose talking about... Uh, students who go abroad right and co-op has absolutely nothing to do with this right this is a completely different department at the university but do you have any way of managing students that are literally not in the country because i know in one of the questionnaires it says will you be residing in canada at the time at at the present moment or the time you're you're at uh your job i i just want to set this straight is there any conflicts that happen because students go abroad so specifically asking if co-op has a problem with students accepting like international placements. Not necessarily. Inter- like, sense? let's say I'm out in Italy. Uh, mm-hmm. Just I'm not saying that we, they have a program in Italy or anything, but just let's say I'm in Italy. I get an offer from someone in Toronto in my application season. Mm-hmm. It's somewhere in Toronto. Now, does co-op have an issue with me accepting that if A, I stay in Italy or B, I come back to Canada? Can you give me both scenarios? That's a very good question. So in that case, it's more on a case-by-case basis. We have wow. to review the okay. specific situation. And honestly, a huge part it comes down to is having work permits. Okay. Right? That's why at least when it comes to our placements, when they're within Canada, we know what's within the bounds of work permits and we're not really delving too much that territory. Okay. But take our students who go to Germany, for example. We actually have to have one-on-one meetings with them to make sure they're actually going through the process correctly, right? Because we don't want them to delay anything on that aspect from not being able to go to Germany for a placement. Okay. And it's really dealing more with like international law instead of just um, co-ops policies. So yeah. that's why it's easier just to stay within Canada to find placements. A large majority of you are employers are within Canada as well, especially yes. within Ontario. And that's really the big reason of it, too, is you're already busy with assignments, midterms, and exams. 
why add another headache on top of it if you needed that, right? Right. Yep, that's mm-hmm. fair. And, okay, so let, let's take a pause on, uh, you know, the whole international aspect of this. Uh, let's mm-hmm. rewind a bit, actually. Okay. Uh, one of the main draws of co-op, right, and I forgot to mention this, is that people who get co-ops, and you say there's typically three, right, mm-hmm. and can be four specifically in the computer science department, right, if I right. remember that correctly? Yes. Uh, okay. Your employer will likely, very likely, either A, give you an offer back, or B, push you to have an offer back. Do you know what percentage of students have that from the ones you talk to, at least? Something like that. That's a really good question. So when it comes specifically to, like, offers post-graduation, I don't have a specific stat for that. Okay. Because there's so many different situations going on with it. Yeah. But what we do find is when students are going between work terms, so let's say they finish their summer 2023 placement, and now they're competing for a winter 2024 placement. We do find that about 20% of students do actually end up going back to the same employer throughout one work term or another as well. Mm -hmm. All right. A lot of the basics covered. Okay. So... After your first ever work term, you're done. You probably didn't get the position you dreamed of. But the way co-op has it framed, and I did you, I, I don't know if you know why the sequence is like that, but it, it's basically co-op, study, co-op, study. But you mm-hmm. can change it. It's mm-hmm. a bit annoying, but you can change it. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, okay. So <sighs> what if a student decides that... After the first co-op, they're not so happy with co-op. Can they drop co-op after they've had their work work term? Yes, absolutely okay. they can. Whenever they do, I always like to have some kind of conversation first about it as well. And a lot of the times, and I completely get it too, and it could be more of a compliment where they feel like they almost outgrow co-op because they feel like they could do everything on their own now. Yeah. Right? So, and I completely understand, do whatever is best for your own career needs, of course. But knowing that at least we've taught you everything you need to know, starting from dissecting a job posting all the way to accepting an offer as well, at least having co-op as that safety net, knowing you have those resources behind you, especially for your very worst work term is very important. Mm -hmm. So if you decide that co-op isn't for you, No worries. That's perfectly fine. I always like to talk about it first because there could be a different solution for it too. Because maybe you found the job competition was really stressful and maybe we find different ways to go around it by seeing how we tweak your resume. But if you do want to drop afterwards as well because you do feel confident enough and you finally have at least maybe four months of experience under your belt, by all means, we don't stop you if you want to. Uh, We do want to make sure that you at least feel prepared if you're going to go by yourself for it. Right, and I know we're jumping around a lot, but I have to go back to the essay because I forgot a couple questions regarding that. So mm-hmm. when you're done completing your essay and you hand it in on time, as you should, <laughs> does a human actually go through and read every sentence or does it just like kind of get checked for like the word word length? Because as far as I know, as long as you hit the, the word count and you didn't like copy and paste Shakespeare, you're going to make it, <laughs> right? So when it comes to that, we do actually have, we hire TAs actually, and they go through every single report themselves to double check it. So check it for plagiarism, making sure content's correct as well, and making sure, I don't think they're going to fix every single grammatical error on there, to be honest. Um, Not like if I was marking a resume. You are, you're you're like it. trying to check CS students grammar by the way, so. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a professional report, right? So we want to make sure you are listing everything that's required of the report as well. So it's not just like a two second scale. They actually do go one by one. And which is why we hired this team to go through it. Because we want to make sure you are not only learning things from your experiences, but also offering help if we notice you write something you're like, oh gosh, like why didn't we catch that sooner, right? So now going to the next semester, we can help you significantly. Right, okay. And there are different roles within the co-op office, right? So if I'm having issues, I can go to X, Y, and Z, but mm-hmm. in within the office, there's like a secretary, there's people who source stuff, there's people who face the students. What is the structure of the co-op office? Excellent question. So we have about 
I would like to say four different groups. So we have our administrative team. So those are the person or the people you see at front desk. And yes. they help a lot more like the administrative tasks, such as uploading job postings in my success, helping apply to resumes or job postings during round three, and helping to make sure that all a lot more on the employer side of things and helping with some of our assignments, such as sending out final evaluations, for example. Uh, the second group is, comes in my group. So we're the, more the student facing team. So these are your well coordinators and we're here to help answer all of your really more like the academic stuff and everything yes. before you actually get the job and during the actual job term. So this comes work study sequence changes. I become very familiar with the curriculum now. <laughs> helping so many students. Yes. <laughs> with it. Uh, specifically resume help if needed, cover letter help, mock interviews. Basically, anything that you need help from in co-op yes. usually would come from a mobile coordinator because we're at the student facing side. Yes. Now, the opposite to us would be our ERs, our employee readiness co- or employee relations coordinators. Yes. And they're the ones responsible for job development. So maintaining relations with our employers, making sure that job postings are ready for each okay. week coming up. And also trying to see help with the resumes, cover letters, interviews as well, but not as a great of an aspect because they're mainly focused on job development. But okay. they're just as highly skilled. And even better, if you're ever wanting, let's say, to interview a TD, then an ER would probably be the one to go to to ask, hey, what are their interviews like? Yeah. Right? Because they have direct relations with the employer. And then our last group would be your transform team. So this is their team that you usually interact with during your first semester or second year, and they help you go through all those basics, Okay, as we spoke before. All right. And, okay, so let's say... I just lost the question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so... Oh, right, okay. So common misconceptions, I wanted to get on this. So uh, I'm a student, and I've gone to Hiram Walker... I think is one is one that is posted, right? I go there and I do a real stinking job. I'm pretty poor. I don't come in on time. Does this reflect badly on the co-op? What does this, what does a student like kind of messing up or not really messing up? They're kind of like tarnishing their own, their own like reliability, right? Does it reflect back into the co-op? What happens to employee? What happens to like the relationship? Has it ever happened that an employee just like was like, nah, I don't want to be with University of Windsor anymore? Because I hear a lot of things like that happening, but I'm not actually sure if that that's real. Well, I could definitely clarify that rumor for you then. We don't hear a lot of stories about that, which is good. Yes. <laughs> now, for specific employers, I can't really say anything because once again, I'm on the student-facing side. Yes. But I will admit, yeah, it could have hurt the reputation right okay because apart from relationship building is making sure that you want to make sure you do have students who are performing well every semester right Mm -hmm. and especially from our co-op side of things if we do see that a student is struggling for example yes we always want to make sure that we're there for them attesting more for them than the employer right because we want to make sure they're successful at the end of the day so even if you had a rocky start Maybe it's a quick conversation, seeing that why is this happening? And then maybe finding the proper resources needed to resolve those to make sure that you are meeting employer expectations. Right. Okay. So it can kind of reflect badly on the university, but almost no students are incentivized to do that because they want a job and, you know, co-op wants to stamp their seal of approval on as many students as possible. Is there a way to, like, without... (laughs) like kind of get booted out of the co-op program by the way i've always been like is there like a grade requirement i've never actually looked at this yeah good question so the nice thing about co-op courses on transcripts is you don't get a numerical value it's either a pass or not pass yes and what we look for is for four key pieces of information so one we want to make sure that you update your work your work term record to make yes. sure it has your actual supervisor's information on there. Two, we'll do a midpoint check-in just to check in and see things are going. So we'll speak with your employer first and then usually the student right after. And honestly, one of my favorite parts about that is the employer has nothing but positive to say a lot of the time. 
sure there's areas of improvement, but you're one month in, it's going to happen, right? Yes. And I get to share that feedback to the student right after, because a lot of times you may not hear it right away, right? Yes. So especially if you're one month in, you feel like, oh, you know, I'm not doing a great job. Like, maybe I'm going to get fired. No, 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 no. No, that's far from what's going to happen. What's mostly happening is you are doing a great job. And it's just a learning curve you're going through, right? Yes. I felt that too. <laughs> <laughs> and that's good. Well, that good, I want to say. But it happens with like any job, right? Human. Exactly. <laughs> and then the other two key pieces we look at is a final evaluation from your employer. So you have to reach at least a satisfactory level in order yes. to pass your work term. So your overall performance. And then, of course, as we spoke before, the work term reports. So you have to successfully pass that as well. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Lots of information there. Yeah. All right. So Absolutely. when I graduate, and this will be towards the end of my line of questioning. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Sounds no, like you're, you're locked in a room with me. And I'm like, give me your answers. <laughs> you know uh, what? To be honest, I didn't get that at all. From this. Okay. So you're good. Okay. It just felt more like a conversation. So you're fine. <laughs> okay. When I graduate, what will it say on my degree? What do you say? if I completed three or four work terms successfully and handed in my my essay? Okay, good question. So literally on your degree, you'll have cooperative education on your degree title. Mm -hmm. But what's more important is how you market that on your resume to talk about yes. what you do with your work terms. Yes, That's where the true value comes. Because even, let's say, as we said earlier, where maybe a student wants to drop out of co-op after their first work term or second work term, once again, sure, you may not have co-op on your degree, but you have those work terms for life on your resume. Yes. So you can leverage that a lot more than just a few letters on your de degree, right? Just having the word cooperative education. See, what, what like I was trying to do yeah. was like, you know, I was just going to have you answer it straight up like, not much on your degree, and then we go past that, right? And with mm -hmm. the implication that like, you know, you can kind of drop it whenever you want, but like, keep it like low-key. But you know, if you're going to say it yourself, then... Be my guest, I guess. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. Even if you only get like one work term out of it and you okay. feel like you just do all the rest on your own, I would much rather see that. Wow. Because that way that tells me that you've developed the confidence to apply everything you've learned. You're not only transform your work and your school courses to be able to do this on your own now. Okay. Because I uh, understand too, like there are some things you have to worry about, like writing a report at the end, right? It's like, oh, one less worry, right? <laughs> For your work okay. time. So, mm -hmm. there is a weird rule I've seen, and I'd okay. want, I'd like you to clarify it. So, I heard that if it's one employer and they ask for like 16 months and you've already done a term, you can still accept it? Is that right? Because, yep. okay, so that actually adds up to 20 months, which is technically five terms. Mm -hmm. But you can still accept it. Can I hear why? Yes. So basically what we want to do when we look at your work study sequence is we want to make sure you're always returning back to a full-time course load. Yes. So granted, if you have enough courses remaining in your degree to do so, by all means, go for it. And let's say you are on that last work term and you find a 12-month placement. We don't want to say no to a great opportunity, right? So yeah. of course, we'll let you go for it, right? Uh, I know there's even one student, I think he's... I think he's at IBM and this is his final work term, but he's going to end up having like five work terms at the end of his co-op I think I know that student. Oh, you think you do? Yeah. <laughs> and like I said too, with doing work term assessments, so midpoint check-ins and even looking at final evaluations, it ended up great for the student, right? So once again, we don't want to put an obstacle in your way that could be a great opportunity. So the less of we can do that, to make sure that your experience is better, then I don't see why not, right? As long as it right. works with your course sequencing, you're going to graduate at, like, a reasonable time still, <laughs> even if the delay by a few Just semesters. never graduate. <laughs> you're going to be 30 and you're like, okay, you're your 25th work term. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, hmm. theoretically, you could. I mean, you have to be in a full-time workload, so you can't actually theoretically. But you can hmm. extend it at least a year, from what I can tell. Yeah, so absolutely. And that's where I would usually come in. We have like a work study sequence conversation, right? Yes. Try to see what courses are still available. Like yes. if it's only offered in the fall, maybe you have to like delay another one. Or maybe 
ironically maybe extended to 16 months because there's no courses left to take during the fall. Yeah, so the cool thing about 12 months are you, you literally start on the semester you... So you kind of... You mm-hmm. don't actually need that much, but it comes with these weird, like... Four, eight mu- four and eight months are kind of strange because they're going to offset because, especially at the University of Windsor and especially in upper year courses, there's winter onlys, there's fall onlys, and some of them don't even have a summer. So it becomes very, very strange it, unless you know as much as someone like Kyle, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think I, um, I think within the Discord channel, I think I did put a resource in there as well, yes. which kind of shows what course they're offering each semester too. And I know the CSS site does a great job with that, yes. too. Yes. Right. I know sometimes when I speak with students, they'll directly say out of their mouth, is like, oh, I use the CSS site to determine when <laughs> course they're available. So it's a great resource that you guys prepared, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I only helped a little on that, but yeah. <laughs> hey, okay. a li- you still, hey, you still get credit, right? <laughs> Even if it's a little. Okay. Uh, I can't think of any other questions. Do you think I missed some important things? Did I... What... Any misconceptions I missed? I think one frequently asked question would be co-op fees as well. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I know a lot of times students say that they get charged in their first year. You don't. They don't. It comes to co-op. Not at all. So it starts in their second year when you do transform. Yes. That's when your first co-op fee gets paid. So you don't have to worry about anything in your first year as well. And speaking of first year stuff as well, we do realize that... There is more of a need for more like first year support and that postgraduate support as well. Yes, yes, that would be so. Nice. Starting in the winter, we actually have a staff member. So a lot of staffs move around a lot of places right now within our office. <laughs> but starting in the winter, we have someone specifically designed for that to okay. help you pre co op if you or even before transform and that post graduation too. Because I don't know if you know this as well, but you actually have access to my success and job posting still, not yes. through co op. But for like full time opportunities, other internships, opportunities, even like part time employment too. So that is available for you post time graduation already. Right. And I mean, mm-hmm. before we say anything further, I, I want, if you leave this, this podcast without anything learned, can, at least one thing can be remembered. The more co ops you have, even if it's just one, the app, like it's astronomically different than if you had zero versus one versus two. You want at least some form of co-op whether it's from the office or not uh that's what that's what this podcast is about right so whether it's with co-op or not and we we recommend co-op our friends here at co-op uh make sure whether whether you learned anything or not please at least try to get like an internship or co-op uh any any shout outs from you any uh any person anything even anything you're working on Honestly, I, I think a big shout out does actually have to go a little biased to the co op office as well. Of course. Because I know going before going to co op, I was part of CSS, right? <clears throat> and it's amazing to see how much the co op office really does yes. in terms of having to learn so many different fa- faculties on campus and how everything operates at the university, right? Because yeah. we play such an integral role. Where especially if like an engineering student, their whole curriculum revolves around the engineering work terms, study yes. sequencing. Whereas with computer science, we have a lot more flexibility, so we can yes. move things around. Right. But they honestly do such a great job with everything. Like I'm always blown away. Like we could be drowning in emails, but at the end of the day, we still manage. You go through mm-hmm. it, even through some like tough situations. And absolutely, so, like you showed up here. I did. I didn't ask particularly easy questions at all either. Uh, you're coming up, shown to CSS. Right, you answer the questions, right? It just shows, like, how many other uh, co-ops or works, I, I don't even know what programs, I'm just going to call them co-op offices, would do that, mm. right? So, mm. you know, just yeah. food for thought, I guess. Yeah. Any other shout-outs? Oh, yes, like, I did want to shout-out CSS as well. because I know, because I used to be on it too, right? So I know how much work that you guys do behind the scenes, right? Okay. Like I said, just the CSS website alone, where so many students use that one resource to help plan their courses. Yes. That's not readily available to students all the time. So having that resource developed alone is great. Even having this podcast as well. Like how many other computer science societies have that, right? Not many. Right? Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) So even having this opportunity to at least have something recorded, 
that can help new students, especially in first year, learn more about it is a great resource that you're creating. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else to say? Anything I missed? We just say it now. Uh, I will forever hold your peace, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, other than that, if you do have any questions about co-op whatsoever, feel free to reach out to us at coop at uwinsor.ca. So C-O-O-P <laughs> at uwinsor.ca. I'll likely be the one to answer it because I look over all the CS students. But yeah, we're always more than happy to help. Even yep. if it's through like Discord at one in the morning, I've had students message me about things. I'm like, okay, let's see what you need. We'll resolve it together. So yep. we are here to help. Yep. Yeah, you can also find uh, Kyle at Boba Tea, I think, or Chat Time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny? Every time I bring my laptop there, I end up bumping into someone. <laughs> so I think I, I think if I don't do that, then I won't see anyone because I don't know. It's weird how that's happening lately. But yeah, no, you might find me there as well. <laughs> Well, anyways, that was Kyle from Co-op, uh, and that'll be it for this uh, this episode. We'll see you for, like, the ninth episode? Oh my god, we're getting so old. Uh, <laughs> well, the ninth episode in two weeks from now. All right, bye. <laughs>